It is now 1.30 p.m. and the session will now begin. I'll begin this afternoon session with a brief introduction. Welcome to the Canadian Institute of Forestry's National Electronic Lecture Program. My name is Sharon Young and I will be hosting today's session. Today is Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. And this is the first session in the e-lecture series entitled Sharing Knowledge on Some Key Initiatives Happening Across the Canadian Forest Service. This series is brought to you by the Canadian Forest Service and Canadian Wood Fiber Center. The CIF IFC is very pleased to collaborate and host these webinars. Today's session is titled An Update Forest Carbon Science Blueprint for Canada. Discussions on priorities, goals, and visions for the coming decade. Today, we have Jared Wolf, a science policy analyst from Canadian Forest Service, who will be the panel moderator for today's session. Jared holds the position of science policy analyst at the Forest Climate Change Integration Hub within the Research Coordination and Integration Division of the Canadian Forest Service. He is based in Ottawa, and his work focuses on supporting science and policy to enhance climate change mitigation, adaptation, and resilience in Canada's forests. With that, I will now pass it over to Jared. So, thank you, Sharon. So, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, as Sharon mentioned, I'll be leading us through um, the session today, where we'll be learning more about the upcoming updated forest carbon blueprint uh, from a few of the authors. Um, and we'll be talking about kind of where are we going, uh, what is needed um, in order to answer, uh, but from the from the science side, um, in order to answer some future policy um, and science challenges uh, on forest carbon. So before I introduce the panelists today, uh, I want to explain a little bit about our approach for today's session. So we'll be taking a cafe style uh, approach today. So we have five panelists uh, who will be providing an overview of the themes of the Forest Carbon Blueprint. Uh, after each theme, I'll be jumping in to ask them a few questions. Uh, this will serve to uh, provide an opportunity for them based off of their perspectives and their um, own expertise to add a bit more um, to the vision or the, the vision behind the different goals um, within the blueprint, potentially add some more context um, and so on. So while we're doing this and while we're having that discussion too, it's an opportune time. Um, if there are any questions that you have um, and that you wish to ask the panelists to place us within the Q&A uh, section um, of Zoom, uh, and this will serve as an opportunity for us to be able to browse the chat um, and pull up the questions to ask the panelists um, during the Q&A session after the presentation. And with that, I'll um, move to uh, introducing our panelists, all of whom are from uh, the CFS. Uh, when I introduce you, if you don't mind turning your camera on. So first off, we have Dr. Carolyn Smith, a research scientist out of the Pacific Forestry Center uh, based in Victoria, BC whose research includes assessing climate change mitigation um, options for the forest sector, ecosystem modeling, and carbon estimation accounting. We have Dr. Yuha Metsuranta, a uh, research scientist uh, from the Northern Forestry Center and based in Ottawa, Ontario, whose research uh, focuses on the interaction between forest carbon dynamics and climate change, including uncertainty and sensitivity analyses. We have Dr. Mathieu Fortin, a uh, research scientist from the Canadian Wood Fibre Centre, uh, also based out of Ottawa, whose research includes um, expertise in developing and integrating uh, growth and uh, forest tree and stand development models. We also have Dr. Heather McDonald, an interdisciplinary social scientist uh, who works out of the Great Lakes Forestry Centre and Sault Ste. Marie, uh, who works on a host of topics related to uh, for sustainable forest development in Canada and globally, ranging from uh, tree planting to wildfires and more. And finally, we have uh, Sophie Lenoble, a senior policy analyst in the Environment and Climate Policy Division of the Canadian Forest Ser Service, who works on files related to uh, forest carbon domestically and internationally. And with that, um, I'd like to invite uh, Carolyn Smith to lead us to the beginning part of this presentation. Uh, 
there we go. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button there for a second. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. We're delighted to be here today to talk about the Forest Carbon Blueprint and discuss with you the goals, the priorities, and the vision for the next decade. So I first want to acknowledge that we are part of a much broader team. There's a team of people on the Blueprint Update team that involves CFS people from coast to coast. And we thought it was very important to have a national perspective to look at the updated research priorities for the next 10 years. I also want to acknowledge the many people who have contributed. So the Canadian Forest Carbon Science and Policy Community that, that uh, contributed through workshops, through surveys, as well as reviewing documents, and the support we've had from the CFS in hosting these workshops. Now, this is actually uh, the second blueprint. The first blueprint was published in 2012, and it had a very broad vision. And since then, there's been a lot of work done. So there have been advances in forest carbon science that have supported policy development and also supported forest management decisions. And so we thought with this update, it was a good time to reflect, to think about the progress that's occurred over the past 10 years, and then think about the new research priorities to try and orient uh, the research that occurs to support policy. And we have very tricky questions for forest carbon. There's no doubt about that. And we have very vast forests and there's not too many Canadians. <laughs> there's not too many that study forest carbon science. So this was a way to, to organize um, us and, and put us all together to try and solve some of these tricky problems. Now, just a little bit about the process and the timeline. So we actually started this process uh, two years ago. And we started by doing a retrospective summary on the progress. And then we had a couple of workshops. So the first one with uh, CFS participants. And there we reflected on the past and then considered new science policy themes. And then the second workshop brought together the forest carbon community and we refined the science themes. And then we drafted a document and had it reviewed. So many people contributed to this document. And then we're launching it. We were hoping to have it for today. It's almost ready. It's translated. It's formatted. Uh, it's not quite up on a web website. So we hope by next week it'll be available to folks. But we're happy to give you the, the synopsis today. So the first thing we did was, was look at the progress that has occurred since the original blueprint was published in 2012. And there were 10 original research questions. And we tried to identify the progress that's occurred towards answering these questions. And so we did a literature review. We, we had a report that described uh, the progress. We had workshops. We uh, had surveys for our workshop participants. And there was actually general agreement between what we found in the lit review and participants' assessment of the progress to date. So that, that was encouraging. And it was a good time to reflect on how much progress has been made over the past 10 years. And so we've converted that uh, the report on the lit review to a summary article, and we've identified uh, topics and findings where there has been significant pro process progress. Uh, sorry, but we can tell that there are still gaps, and we can tell that new issues have emerged. So based on what we're finding from the review and from our discussions, we're coming up with renewed priorities for the next decade. Now, we have actually 19 different goals that we'll be talking about today. And we have grouped them into five themes. And there, there are different ways to group them, but we thought this was a good way to, to talk about them today. And these five themes are in the renewed blueprint. And we have a listing of the 19 goals and their vision at the end of this PowerPoint presentation. And so we'll make sure it's provided with this presentation. Now, the five themes are all important. They're not ranked, um, and they have 19 goals associated with them. And we'll be talking about each of these themes today in this presentation. Now, the first theme is looking at the impacts of human actions on forest sector carbon. So it's changes in carbon emissions removals in the forest ecosystem. 
as well as considering the emissions from harvested wood products. The second theme is looking at the impacts of environmental factors, climate change, and natural staff disturbances on forest carbon dynamics. So more of the foundational research looking at forest carbon emissions and removals. The third theme is looking at climate change mitigation measures in the forest sector. So how can the forest sector contribute to GHG reduction? And the final two themes look at indigenous perspectives and traditional knowledge, and then connecting carbon to other values. Now the first three themes had elements in the original blueprint, but the last two themes are new. And so we're, we're excited to tell you about all of these themes today. So I'm going to pass over to Yuha to talk about the impacts of human actions on forest sector carbon. Okay, so in the, I guess the first science theme, and these aren't in order of importance or anything, they're just numbered in, uh, uh, in order so that we can talk about them. But so the, the policy relevance of, of this first theme is to, is to help Canada to meet our commitments to report on the impact of humans on uh, forest greenhouse gas emissions and, and removals, as well as to sort of continuously improve these estimates. So under this overall theme, we have we have five goals. The first one relates to basically a, a continuous improvement of the science and the data that underlies these projections, uh, so that we they can uh, uh, so that we can I guess. Uh, continue to sort of generate estimates and their uncertainties that are um, accessible to the public, that are proactively communicated, and that they're broadly accepted by, uh, I guess, the policy community and, and, uh, and society at large. So the, the second uh, goal under this theme is to improve our understanding of uh, the impact of human activities on forest carbon. And this is at, this is at the site and the landscape level. So here it would, it would uh, this goal would relate to sort of um, a better understanding of what exactly happens when we undertake a management activity on a forest stand and then how to scale those estimates up to uh, a landscape level, like how much of, of given activities might occur. So this would include uh, things like that we would, this would include activities like forest harvesting, but also as well as silviculture and other management, forest management activities. Um, the third research goal would be is that we would like to have improved spatially explicit modeling and monitoring of forest carbon and to compare these estimates to global forest carbon uh, estimates. So the, the vision here is that at the, over the course of when this blueprint is enforced, we would like to work on developing a, a fully spatially explicit framework for quantifying anthropogenic impacts on forest carbon. And that this will have a high spatial resolution and allows for increased accuracy and, and, and for easier comparison to other models. Um, the fourth research goal is to expand our national forest sector carbon anthropogenic estimates. So what, what we're aiming to do here is to continue to be a leader in forest carbon science, to have, continue to have a strong capacity to address uh, forest carbon policy issues and have the ability to analyze them at multiple levels. And these will uh, continue to evolve to meet um, these domestically and internationally. And, and the fifth goal is it's continuous improvement in modeling and forecasting systems. So this is, this is where we work on the underlying sort of computing systems, data systems uh, that enable the rest of this work uh, to proceed. So, the vision there is that that this will uh, these estimates will be generated by a, a a system of open and transparent models and data that will allow us to test that will allow the system to be regularly tested and updated and that we can very easily uh, evaluate uh, the estimates relative to independent data and that kind of thing. Excellent. Thanks, Yuha. Um, I'll jump in and ask a couple of questions. Um, before I do, I might mention, I think we're having a little bit of um, technical difficulty with, with the audio at times. So maybe kind of, um, it, might, it seems to work better if we're kind of speaking towards the screen potentially. But um, so I guess maybe with my first question, um, 
under the goal of improving carbon estimates, you mentioned this uncertainty piece. Um, and in modeling, I know we're often confronted with, with uncertainty in estimates. Um, and while estimates often come accompanied with a certain amount of uncertainty, I'm wondering if I might be able to speak more um, to say the research or the approaches uh, needed in order to kind of face this uncertainty when we're estimating carbon. Yeah, okay, so when I, the way I, I would answer that is through the reference. There's IPCC guidance around this question, which is to say that these kinds of estimates should be accurate, which means that they're not systematically over or underestimating values. And then as far as can be judged, so there's this qualifier in there to make it realistic. And then uh, and that the estimates are precise as far as it's practicable. So what we're, I guess the part of the continuous improvement is to is to evaluate the system with respect to this guidance. Um, that being said, uh, uncertainty is kind of like the source for that I see as a sort of a source of friction between in the science policy interface. So a, a, a design feature of science is that we undertake research and that and that this may result in changes to certain estimated values. And there's sometimes pressure that this should happen, that, that this can't happen, that, that this shouldn't happen all at once, or there shouldn't be too much change. So there's this sort of, that's where there can be this sort of friction. So we've included the, we've included in, in this theme uh, improvement in the estimates as well as their associated uncertainties. So that uh, we, and are some strategies that we follow is that we undertake research, obviously, to understand this better. Um, but in order to sort of demonstrate that it's occurred, the, we often skip a step where we actually formally quantify, you know, what are, is our estimated, our uncertainty beforehand. So this is something we hope will, will sort of um, become more standard practice. Um, I guess as part of it, we, there, eventually we will kind of need to get to this point where we sort of assimilate uncertainty into our decision making. Where it's instead of so, for example, this might may, this might require us to sort of become um, to live a little bit more readily with ambiguity and and different perspectives. So, for example, there might be, and Matthew will speak to this next, where there might often be different options in terms of like models that could be applied or data that could be used. And and, and so this, we, I guess we we would say that this shouldn't necessarily be seen as a problem, but rather as something like that providing. Uh, more useful information. And then uh, secondly, I guess maybe I have some of the things maybe Heather will discuss in the fifth theme is, is I think some interdisciplinary science studies around uh, actually investigating decision makers and how they how they use and perceive uh, information when it's somewhat ambiguous or or changing over time. So yeah, that's I guess how I would describe that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so it's it's about reducing uncertainty, but it's also understanding that it's kind of part of the process too, and learning to kind of be able to to kind of live with it, right? To make decisions within that. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe with that, I actually will move on and keep us moving on to the next um, theme. So I'll possibly I'll pass it off on to Mathieu Fortin to introduce us to the next um, theme of the blueprint. Yep. So. Um... Well, this is a second theme, uh, and as Carolyn mentioned early on, this theme is focused on the foundational research uh, that will support uh, the design of effective policies and also carbon accounting in general. So we've, we've uh, identified five uh, research goals, uh, and I will go through them uh, quickly and provide you with the uh, main elements of discussion for each one of them and a vision. So um, the, first, the first goal, goal A, is focused on forest growth and productivity. As you all know, trees sequester carbon, and part of this carbon is uh, initially released, well, they, they sequester it through uh, photosynthesis, but part, approximately half of it is uh, released uh, through respiration, but half of it remains sequ sequestered. And this is uh, what we usually refer to as the net primary productivity. So although that knowledge is, is well known, uh, net primary productivity is still a challenge when it comes to estimate what it is and, and also how, um, uh, how it is affected by uh, factors, environmental factors, and, uh, and, and such as climate, soil, and, and others. 
So um, there's there's clearly a challenge there. Um, so over the years, um, we've seen some initiatives. Uh, if we want to estimate this, estimate this uh, net primary productivity throughout Canada, we definitely need data and we need data across Canada. So there has been some uh, initiatives undertaken at CFS. For example, we have the National Forest Inventory now. It provides uh, data throughout Canada. There's also the MagPlots initiative, uh, which aim at gathering the data from provincial and territorial agencies uh, I mean, plot inventories and, and to provide them, eventually provide them for uh, whole Canada. And there's also uh, uh, um, one initiative that I want to uh, uh, outline is the CFS Trend D, uh, which is a, a repository of tree ring data, which is really helpful when it comes to assess the annual forest productivity. Um, Something that we, we need also to work on is the climate sensitivity of our forest growth models. So uh, at the provincial level, those models used in, in, for timber supply, many of them are still not climate sensitive. And those that are climate sensitive are not fully climate sensitive. So we envisage over the next decade that this will be developed and improved. So in terms of vision, what we see uh, in, in 10 years from now is to have larger, uh, large scale data sets available uh, and also more climate models that are climate sensitive and that can provide the annual forest growth, annual forest growth predictions. And thirdly, we would like to see something that has not been very popular in forestry, that is ensembles of model predictions, something that the IPCC is really good at. When you see those climate, the future climate scenarios, they're, they're based on, on projections from sometimes from 20 to 30 models. So that is something that we should strive to achieve in, in, in forestry, at least have a couple of models to simulate uh, what's going to happen at the landscape level. Our second research goal is focus on what what happens to those trees when, when they die or, or the biomass, the dead biomass? So there is a biomass turnover in decomposition and it's a large carbon pool. So the, the, the carbon pool in the soil and also in the dead organic matter of the litter is really important. And we know that it, is, it has affected this rate and, and decomposition uh, is affected by uh, climate change. However, there's a really a lack of data here. Uh, it's not as documented as forest growth, for example. So we we'll definitely need to improve or, or to collect more data. Um, so the vision that we, we see in 10 years from now, it, it includes more representative data of uh, the dead organic matter turnover in the composition, a better understanding of the role of soil decomposition, geochemistry, environmental control, natural disturbances, and soil biodiversity on this turnover and decomposition rates. Uh, our third goal is something that you've heard certainly, even if you're not working in this, it's the, the vulnerab vulnerability of peatland and permafrost soils to climate change. So we need clearly to advance our understanding on the carbon cycle uh, in, in, those, uh, in those soils. Um, so we know that there is a, a, a long-term accumulation of carbon in cold and anoxic conditions in, in those ecosystems. They're vulnerable to climate change and the permafrost is actually thawing. And you've probably seen those pictures where, where the trees are, are are no longer straight, they're, they're kind of leaning one, uh, one in a, on another. Um, so we, we need to better understand what, what is going on. So that will require the modeling of carbon dynamics in these ecosystem, but it's still challenging given the lack of data. Uh, efforts have been undertaken to map peatlands at, at the national scale and collect data to develop, uh, to, well, to develop models or improve the, the, ex the existing ones. So the vision that we have for this theme related to peatland and permafrost data, uh, permafrost soils, is that in 10 years from now, we will have much more data available. And in the meantime, we hope to develop methods for estimating methane fluxes, especially knowing that methane has a, a global warming potential that is approximately 20 to 25 times that of CO2. So it's a very important component of our greenhouse gas emission. We also hope to have a better 
understanding of the carbon cycle in these ecosystems and how to assess how vulnerable they are to climate change. Um, so I'm going to move on to our fourth uh, research goal, which is uh, something really new in this uh, blueprint. Uh, we now know that there is um, a connection between terrestrial and aquatic systems. So we know that the carbon is leached, for example, from terrestrial uh, ecosystems, and eventually part of it is going to uh, end up in the, the aquatic ecosystems. Part of that will eventually be released. Part of it will be sequestered in sediments. But this is something, this, this has been really identified as a, as a knowledge gap. So we don't, we know that this exists, but we don't know uh, really, we're not really good at quantifying those fluxes. So this is something that we will need to improve uh, in, in the next decade. Uh, this is a key to understand a landscape integrated uh, carbon cycle or, or eventually to do the carbon accounting at the landscape level. We need to account for all type of ecosystems and, and yeah, those uh, wetland and streams and river and lakes are, are connected to forests, so we cannot simply uh, uh, not consider them. So um, the vision we have in 10 years is to have uh, a monitoring of forest watersheds that will provide data to develop models, decision support tool, and those tools uh, that, that we need to assess the different uh, uh, fluxes that we call lateral carbon flows in, in, in this context. We hope to have high resolution digital elevation models to estimate the carbon loss or accumulation within the landscape, depending on the type of ecosystem. And finally, the fifth uh, goal is really focused on natural disturbances. So we know, we all know that um, the disturbance regime or regimes with a NAS, given that we have many disturbances, um, in the past it is, is being affected by climate change. So if we just look at last year's situation, we never had such a, a year with so many burnt area and, and the carbon release in the atmosphere is, is a, well, those fires have released a tremendous amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, so we need to take this into account. We need to predict in the future how the regimes, uh, the disturbance regimes are going to be affected by climate change. But this remains a challenge. Um, initiatives have been undertaken to better map the extent of historical disturbances and to track new one. But it's not so far, we're, we're still far from being able to predict, okay, next year is going to be, uh, we're going to break a, a, a record of a fire uh, because of this or that. So predicting the occurrence of those disturbances is still a challenge. And combined with human activities, it can cause large changes in the storage of carbon uh, at the national level. So the vision we have, um, we, we would like to have a national assessment of disturbed areas. We, still, we have it for fire right now, uh, disturbed areas and severity by disturbance type. So we would like to add uh, other disturbances as well and not only consider fire. We would like to integrate uh, this into a model to quantify the effect of those disturbances whenever they occur on the different carbon pools. And finally, to develop models of climate sensitive disturbance occurrence and intensity. That means being able to predict, okay, given the climate is changing, uh, we expect that we will have more fire and not only that we will have more, but uh, we want to, to really quantify the recurrence and, and, and the intensity of those fires. Um, yeah, Jared, to you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, I might ask just a quick question before I move on to the next the the next theme. So you do mention um, that part of the visions here are like large, um, large decision support tools or larger data sets. Um, do you anticipate kind of any kind of challenges in regards to how these are being produced and like how might we be able to achieve that kind of vision? Yeah, well, at the moment, it's really interesting to see that many, um, many models exist in, in the provincial agencies, territorial agencies, but we're not necessarily aware of it. And people are working in teams, they're collaborating, but we're not really collaborating at the national level. Uh, I mean, we, we need to foster the collaboration between those teams or among those different teams. Uh, and there's also uh, something that is crucial is to share data. So uh, I mentioned several times that we need to build large data sets, make them available 
have a coverage of whole Canada so that we're, we're going to be able to build those decision support tools. So we definitely need to foster collaboration among uh, research teams. For sure, definitely. Um, okay, thanks, Mathieu. We'll move on to the, the next theme. Um, to believe I'm passing it off on to Carolyn Smith to lead us to the next one. Yes, thank you. So the next theme is dealing with climate change mitigation measures in the forest. So it's the forest sector. So it's looking at how there can be a change in behavior or technology that can reduce emissions in the future. And it can be the forest ecosystem. It can also be wood use and substitution benefits. So in terms of the policy relevance, climate change mitigation is all about supporting GHG reduction efforts. And at the same time, trying to achieve environmental and societal co-benefits. So the, the goal of mitigation is really to ask the what if questions. What if we were to change what we're doing in the future? And what would the carbon implications be of that change? Now we have quite a few research goals related to this theme. And then we're trying to identify climate change mitigation opportunities in the forest management, including natural disturbance management, in forest conversion, in the use of wood products and bioenergy. And I'm really seeing the, the input uh, on this theme related to expansion. So climate change mitigation has been studied for a while. It's a maturing field. And the input we get on this theme is really looking at many more different opportunities. So for example, if we look at forest management, uh, typically in the past, we would have changed harvest levels, maybe increased growth as part of the options for the future. But now we're seeing many different possibilities. So what if we change harvest levels? What if we change stem density? What if we change species composition? You know, many different activities that could be modeled in the forest. And as we know, the forests are quite different across the country. And so different activities would be modeled in different locations. And new is the inclusion of adaptation measures. So understanding what we can plant where and how it will grow and how will that impact carbon in the future. Also new is quantifying um, natural disturbance risk and management. So before we talked about natural disturbance risk and adaptive changings, but now the, the goal and the vision is really to quantify that and consider options for natural disturbance management. And so that's really interesting to me to see that expansion in, in the number of scenarios and also what's included in the forest management. Uh, the second one deals with forest conversion. So uh, afforestation, having land converted to a forest, reduced deforestation is avoiding forest con conversion, as well as looking at restoration, particularly after natural disturbances, and reclamation as well. So there's a lot of interest in these scenarios, um, a lot of uncertainty, I think, with, uh, with respect to the soil. So it's really looking at quantifying uh, the carbon uptake and the avoided carbon emissions from reduced deforestation. And again, at different scales in different regions and different parts of the country. Uh, the third one is looking at wood use and wood products. And it really is including all of the emissions in the life cycle from the extraction to the transportation to the production. Um, and then if there's any use and how long is the carbon stored in that product? And then what happens after you're done using it? So what's its post-consumer use? Is it incinerated? Is it put into a landfill? So it's really tracking the carbon all the way from the forest until it goes back up into the atmosphere. So what are the ways that we can reduce emissions from wood products throughout the entire life cycle? And uh, finally, the, the last scenario is looking at bioenergy. And again, bioenergy has been studied a lot in the past, but now we're seeing an expansion. So consider all the feedstock possibilities, you know, green wood, salvage wood, mill residues, forest residues, everything. Consider different transformations to heat and, and electricity and consider different avoided fossil fuels. And again, regional, um, expanding out to different parts of the country have different um, energy profiles. So it's really great to see all of those uh, opportunities that we have for climate change mitigation scenarios. And then the final goal really relates to developing the forecasting system. So it, it is a bit difficult to predict the future. <laughs> you know, we do have to develop uh, methods and models and link them together in order to understand uh, what the baseline will be like and then what our climate change mitigation 
scenario will be like on top of that. And being able to have these spatially explicit and quickly updated and to be able to run a, a wide variety of scenarios is, is really the goal. So it's, it's being able to have those systems available to us in the future. And I'll pass back to you, Jerry. Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Very interesting. Um, I might actually bring in Sophie into the conversation here uh, for a bit of a kind of policy perspective on this one. So my question to you, Sophie, is what do you think or what do you see as the, the role of policy within this realm in terms of, say, facilitating climate change mitigation and the science kind of, and, the, and the research related to it? Yeah, thanks, Jared. So, so I guess taking a, a broader view of it, so Canada has committed to reduce emissions by 40 to 45% below 2005 levels by 2030, and ultimately achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Um, so, and we, and we published cl climate plans, and in these plans, they recognize the role um, and include investments in forests and wood products and nature-based solutions um, as policy measures to help us reach um, these climate targets. Um, and we've seen, you know, over over the over the past several years, you know, a lot of uh, different um, mitigation measures being put in place um, at the federal level by provinces and territories and other organizations. Um, just as a, a as a few examples, here at CFS, we have um, we have the Two Billion Trees program and the Green Construction Through Wood program. Um, there's lots on the web. If you'd like more information on those programs, you can just Google them. Um, but but really, um, the science um, has been and it continues to be really key to informing um, the development and the implementation um, of these forest based mitigation efforts. Um, and our understanding of these different measures and how they can help us achieve our targets has really increased a lot over the last um, decade and and you know and as and as Carolyn was mentioning, um, you know, the best mitigation approach, um, it varies a lot by by region. So, you know, studies coming up on this, very, very important, um, given the diversity of the climate and the, the, the ecology um, and the management practices across Canada. Um, so, yeah, so in short, I guess, you know, continuing the collaboration across governments and organizations is really key to to getting in place, you know, the science and the policy development that we need in this realm to, to help Canada um, get to its net zero target. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, very. Thanks for the insights there. Um, I'm going to move us along into the next theme, too, and I'm going to invite um, Heather McDonald up to um, introduce this theme. Oh, Heather, I believe you're on mute. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to present this important theme. Uh, as a non-Indigenous person, I cannot speak for what topics should be in considered in this theme, but I will present the steps that we took for this chapter of the Blueprint Collaboratively with No Quaywash. Uh, from uh, which is Natural Resources uh, Resource Canada's Indigenous Reconciliation Sector, with NAFA, as well as with the cherished elder and residents at Northern Forestry Centre. We are grateful to acknowledge the work underway with an expert in Indigenous me methodologies, a visual artist, and more recently, I would like to acknowledge work with Dean Asinaway. Advancing Indigenous co-management and reconciliation were identified as sub-themes in this chapter of the Blueprint. During the past year, our work challenged us at the Canadian Forest Service to develop our own authentic connection to calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and by saying how this affects forest carbon research. From these conversations and studies emerged a blueprint theme, which recognizes both Indigenous methodologies and Western science as equal, complementary and independent, and that significant changes to research practices and collaborations are needed beyond what we have at the Canadian Forest Service. 
And thanks, Heather. So you sp you've spoken about some of the stuff that we've kind of been happening throughout the development of, of the blueprint. And as Carolyn mentioned that this is a new theme. Um, it wasn't in the original blueprint. And so it's something that we've identified as a priority in this one. Um, I'm wondering if I might be able to just comment on what's happening next. Like, is there any kind of um, thoughts or kind of insight that you have on that? There's always lots of exciting cooking in the kitchen. Um, we are working with uh, some great collaborators, uh, like I said, with expertise in Indigenous methodologies and uh, working with uh, that uh, that expert and other experts taking their words. We're working with an Indigenous, a young Indigenous graphic artist to translate some of those understandings into uh, a visual artistic product. So I hope there's more to come. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, we'll move on to the next theme as well, which I believe is your yourself too. So I'll let you uh, take the floor again. Thanks, Jared. Um, so for the next theme, and this is the, our final forest carbon research theme, it recognizes that the scale of challenges facing us, such as climate change and biodiversity, are, are so big that it compels us to work together across our respective disciplines. During the 2023 workshops, we collected contributed ideas about this and the other forest research themes, which for this theme I turned into a, a word cloud. But we continue to collect feedback about future research directions. Interdisciplinary approaches are at the heart of nature-based solutions. I think Carolyn talked a little bit about that, and which draws from an ecological approach to climate change action, but it also incorporates biodiversity, human health, and well-being. So it's very broad outcomes. And this can be thought of as carbon plus. Uh, and this is a, something that we picked up on here for this theme. Uh, Nature-based solutions do not take away from the need for action on greenhouse gas emissions to meet climate goals, but nature-based solutions address multiple challenges simultaneously. My colleagues shared the, the future for forest carbon research directions looking ahead. The feedback and literature reviewed show that there was a great amount of interest in forest carbon research. Since the 2012 Forest Carbon Blueprint, substantial energy has been invested in cross-sectoral efforts to produce new forest carbon estimates and data sets. Multidisciplinary teams can contribute to sharing forest carbon information rapidly, allow, along with communication about estimate uncertainty, which is what I think you all was talking about, as well as in linking diverse impacts from carbon sequestration and ecological health to human well-being. Thanks. In many ways, it's kind of pulling in a lot of different um, themes from before, but in like or priorities in the other themes, but in addition to kind of connecting to other disciplines as well. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned the, the communication piece, um, and I find sometimes you find with forest carbon um, can be kind of challenging to communicate um, on the topic as well. I mean, we mentioned this with the uncertainty piece earlier, Ethan. Um, do you mind maybe commenting a bit more on maybe how this piece can be um, advanced or improved on? Uh, I think a behavioral approach would, would be helpful to understand people's perceptions towards risk and also the end state that people wish to re reach and looking at uh, different groups as we, like we've collaborated with a wide variety of groups over 2023, enough to know that, to observe that there are areas of consensus that we have, although we have areas of difference. So as a social scientist, I always try to find bridges between different groups. And I believe there's a lot to work, work with here. Um, in terms of uh, decision-making, uh, we're doing some research with different graduate students to understand different um, like reference points that people have in terms of what they want to achieve with different programs. So that's really important to understand the motivations behind uh, people's involvement in these programs so that you can link 
those motivations to the outcomes. Thanks. Um, maybe one more question on this, and I'll, I'll bring in maybe Sophie as well to answer this one. Um, this is looking at carbon and other values. I'm wondering if you can maybe speak more on to kind of what is intended behind the, the term kind of other values and what that means kind of to connect to and maybe even like how do we measure that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jared. Um, so, so yeah, so when we're talking about forest values, um, we mean the values that they provide to people and society and, uh, and the environment. So these could include carbon se sequestration, of course, timber supply, but also things like livelihoods and biodiversity, as Heather mentioned, and cultural services. Um, so, and, uh, and so in terms of monitoring these values, um, so some are relatively straightforward to monitor and we have processes in, in place already to do so. Um, so like carbon, for example, as we know, um, and economic factors like jobs, GDP, et cetera. Um, so we are so we already report on many of these and and um, there's a lot of information actually in the the state of the forest report, which is a great resource if you want to learn more about some of these values. But for for other forest values, um, so these will require a lot of advancements in science to help us better understand them and what we can do to monitor and report on them. Um, so things like human well-being um, and adaptation to climate change, as was mentioned earlier, things like reducing the risk of wildfire, these are more difficult for us to measure right now. So, so yeah, so research is ongoing in these areas um, and it's a really important area for informing our policy, especially as it relates to nature-based solutions, um, reporting on these values and what we are achieving in our impl Im implementation of nature-based solution measures is, is a really important part of, of our programming. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sophie. So I think we've, we've had an opportunity to go through all of the five um, themes in here a bit more from each of our different panelists. So I'm going to just close this off here and um, speak to a bit of looking forward. Um, so we learned a lot from the last blueprint. Um, as we mentioned, there's been lots of progress made within this area. Um, in addition, one of the things that we're we're interested in in, in considering as well is is uh, kind of periodic check-ins um, to kind of re-examine these the priorities and check in on on progress um, within the forest uh, carbon science community. Um, in addition. Um, looking into the next few years, we see this as an opportunity to be able to kind of gather that community again, um, learn about progress, learn about the work that's being done and, and continue to kind of discuss what are those, um, are we, uh, what are the challenges, um, what are the emerging, emerging challenges, um, so we can kind of be responsive in, in that sense. Um, and, and as Carolyn mentioned, um, the blueprint document is almost ready. Um, so once we have it, once it's been published, um, we're happy to share a link. And, and just to close off here, um, Carolyn has also mentioned if you, if you have any kind of questions, she's happy to serve as a contact point um, for, for the blueprint. Um, and, and as was mentioned earlier too, there's a lot of work that kind of that went into this from a number of different people. So the blueprint team, but also as the, the kind of forest uh, kind of community as well. So there was workshops in um, earlier last year, um, as well as a few people who also um, Help with some of the review of the of the drafts too. So uh, definitely want to make sure that that work is acknowledged here, and that we really greatly appreciate the work that's been done, and, and hopefully it can it can continue. So with that, um, we can move on to the discussion period. But before I do that, maybe I'll pass it off on to Sharon. Um, I believe she has a few polls that they wish to share from CIF. Ah, excellent. Popped up on the screen. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, I'll give you a chance to answer those uh, those survey questions. And again, please use the Q and A se uh, section to put in the questions. I see a number of different uh, questions that have come in. Um, so maybe I'll start off with um, Tapreen. Um, I know you, you. There's a question that I believe you has already answered. Um, related to carbon sequestration um, by tree species, if there's information on that, and if there's potential information as to, or like 
where one can find that type of data. Um, I don't know if you have, if you want to start off on that or if, um, and if someone else wanted to jump in on, on kind of where you can find that information. Sure, I'm trying my best to answer the questions as they come in <laughs> and try to be helpful. So wait, uh, I was actually typing another answer there, Jared, so I can't, I uh, I missed what your question was to me specifically. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no but, uh, worries. Yeah, so, so if it's, so there's a couple questions about like, uh, you know, we do that are related to, yeah, we do understand and are able to model the differences in the amounts of carbon that are, you know, sequestered or that are, or, or the growth rates of different species. And usually they're, you know, they're, those are estimated by, I guess, or at least in, in, in one way of estimated though, is to use growth in forest growth and yield models. And those are just something that Matthew discussed in his section a little bit. So it's not, so, you know, there aren't, there aren't really easy answers to say that, okay, well, this is your, it, it, there is going to be, you know, in, in the specific question about what should I be planting, it's not, it's not always so easy to have generic answers to say that species A, B, or C will always be better than species D, E, or F, or whatever. It's, you really need to know more specific information about the sites that you're planning on doing and things like this. So, but if you're interested, you know, the the, mod, the class of models that we use for that in forestry are growth and yield models. Thanks, Yuhai. I don't know if anybody else want to weigh in on that one at all. Okay, uh, we can move on to the next one. Um, so we have a question about um, Dustbinder based on um, questions related to um, emissions uh, within the forest. Um, and if there's um, any information or a I guess, here we go. Are are they based on um, models that are different than NRCANs, hence the use of difference in reported values um, and other me measuring things differently? I'm wondering if there's any kind of nuance potentially or, or information one can be able to add in there. Yeah, so so there, there obviously are. So in many cases, I, I, uh, the, uh, the media articles and the science articles that come out of it, they're using the estimates that we generate in, in our can using the NFC Mars system. And uh, the way I would, I guess, describe it is that there's sort of, there's a uh, differences of opinion about uh, how specifically the, we should calculate what the human impact on forests is. And, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, we, we are working to kind of understand those differences and be able to, uh, you know, um, you know, better quantify what that impact is. But as I understand it now, that's essentially the where the the, the difference in points of view is. And there, there, I would describe them in many cases as you know, we're all reasonable people, and we can disagree about these things. And and I guess one of the other thing I would add is that so we they are in, in many cases they're using data that we're uh, generating and and publishing in the national inventory reports. So one of the I, one of the things we're talking about in this blueprint to really get back to this is to be more open and transparent. And one of the things that happens when you do that is that more people start to look at it, uh, the answers and ask questions. And and those are uh, you know uh, are important. It's important to keep asking those questions because then it makes that's part of the improvement process is to be able to you know have those open to criticism and and, and discussion. And if I could just add, generally, uh, there's much more interest in forest carbon than there was 10 years ago. <laughs> so we were we were pleasantly surprised that so many people wanted to come to our forest carbon workshop to the blueprint. And in fact, had to turn people away because we weren't entirely sure that our systems could handle uh, so many people. So it, it's great to see the interest. Um, it's great to see uh, as part of the blueprint, the expansion, you know, moving beyond the managed forest, going to the unmanaged forest, going to all forests, going to wooded areas. So uh, that's exciting and also very challenging at the same time. So uh, can we do it in 10 years? I guess that's the question. And as we go through the check-ins, we'll see how much progress is, is coming towards having fully spatially explicit for the whole country. Thanks. Yeah, it's interesting to see how much of 
um, how much interest that happened in that there was <laughs> to a point there's only so much that like the, the online tools could um, support. So it's good to see. Um, I'm just following up with another question. So one popped up at the bottom here from Frank. Um, what is the scale of uh, permafrost contribution to carbon as compared to the impact uh, from forest management? And uh, what are the, the options to address permafrost impacts, if any? Um, Mitu, I'm not sure if you'd want to weigh in here since that does fall within your theme, but I know that we have a few other um, researchers that work that contributed to the theme too that might be able to add more to that. Yeah, it falls in my theme, but that's really not my field of expertise. That, that that's that's the problem. So uh, I can hardly provide any 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 response here. I'm sorry. However, if if uh, well, I, I can eventually forward that question to Kara uh, uh, Kara mm -hmm. Webster, who, who's uh, our expert on this topic. Yeah, permafrost and peatlands are kind of the emerging ones. And there's been a fair amount of work on peat. You know, the peatland module exists and, and uh, has projections, estimates. Uh, permafrost, I think, is harder. I think we're a little bit behind there. And again, not my area either, but <laughs> this is the input we're receiving from the community. And then considering different options um, on addressing permafrost impacts seems to come down to avoiding disturbances. That's that's what I'm getting. But uh, I'm happy to have input from the experts on that one. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, if, um, yeah, we can definitely follow up on that question. Um, might have time for a few more questions. So I'm, there's one related to a class in Sault Ste. Marie and wondering about adding on um, for adding to the forest species uh, would each would vary by region. And I wonder if this kind of gets at one of the other questions that I had related to theme two relate or, or theme two and theme one. How do we kind of represent some of that diversity um, across across Canada? I mean, it's a vast country, as we've we've noted, and there's going to be changes, differences in climate, um, soils, etc. Um, I wonder if you would you be able to comment on on that piece? Um, well, uh, of course, it, it's really it's really different across the the provinces, and the the thing that is really hard for us here is to um, how the forest species would each region vary? Okay. Actually, I'm not really sure I understand the question. Could you repeat that? <laughs> it's because I was actually replying to somebody else in the chat. So I, I missed the beginning of the question. Yeah, for sure. I guess, how do we represent that regional diversity? In models, you or, mean? Yeah, you had a see Roger hand up. Well, OK, so I, I, I heard the question. I could kind of jump in. So I mean, we obviously, like, we have we have maps of Canada that, that tell us uh, to a certain degree, like which species are growing where. We have forest inventory maps, the traditional thing that we have. And then there's many different uh, sort of remote sensing based products that will tell you. I mean, at some level, they, they, they depend, they, you know, I guess, you know, depending on the level of detail, it may tell you just that, uh, you know, you have, you know, the forest, the broad forest type hardwood, softwood, mixed wood, but then also like, you know, the dominant species. So it's basically this sort of, we know this from uh, different uh, essentially remote sensing products uh, and, and surveys and supplemented by ground surveys, like which species grow in which part of the country. Sure, great, thanks. Um, I realize we're, we're getting close to the end of time. Um, I was wondering if we might be able to, I have one more question maybe that I can maybe pose to the whole, um, the whole panel um, and each of you can kind of weigh in. I'm curious throughout this process, um, what were some of the benefits or kind of what stood out to you when we were going through the this updating process? Um, what did you see as kind of being um, a highlight of that? I'm happy to start uh, on that one. And and for me, it was really great uh, to see the the increased interest in carbon and to have input from so many different people. Uh, there's so many great ideas out there. And we were starting to connect people 
uh, from across the country. And I think that was that was great because many of the people who were involved in the original blueprint have retired. You know, they've left, they've switched positions. So, uh, and many people have joined and the pandemic was pretty hard <laughs> on collaborations. Um, so it was great to be able to connect with people from coast to coast to coast. Yeah, just to, to build on that, I think it was it was really great getting people from the different disciplines into the same room together and discussing. So the policy people with the research scientists, with the with industry and environmental groups, like getting us all in one room and discussing this this topic that everyone is, you know, has a lot of common ground on was uh, was really great in terms of getting connections. I can contribute as well. I'll build on that same idea, which was the, to me, the benefit was the collaboration. It was an honor to work with such brilliant scientists on the forest carbon side. Um, I was really, I feel very privileged to take part in it. I'm not a forest carbon scientist. I'm a social scientist. So it was wonderful, but also within CFS, but also outside of CFS too. I was so honored to speak with Nokwewash and NAFA and the elder at uh, Anarcan, it was really great. So thanks, I appreciate it. Um, maybe with that, I mean, I, I hope that, I think maybe speak for the rest of the Blueprint team too, that I think that continued kind of community building is really important, I think, but particularly coming off, out from the last few years too, so. Um, Maybe I'll pass it back to Sharon if there's any kind of closing thoughts um, and um, information you'd like to give. Oh, actually, I just want to say thank you all for your participation in our CAF elect, uh, electronic lectures. A special appreciation goes out to our speakers for delivering out this outstanding presentation. Uh, we look forward to reconnecting with you in the future electro sessions. Okay, with that, bye everyone. Take care.